actually another gospel that had come upon the people there in Galatia. I want to start by asking you a question, though. Is there another gospel? Let me ask you this way, then. Which gospel is providing your salvation? Which gospel is providing your salvation? First two words in that question imply that there is another gospel. However, as you just answered me, there, there's not another gospel that we know of, but there are other gospels, unfortunately, that different people espouse, that they believe. Some teach different gospels. This was the problem here in Paul's day. In fact, very early on in the life of the Christian church, many theological battles came up over this very issue about what gospel was the correct gospel. When Jesus was a grown man, teaching and preaching throughout his native country, he was questioned, challenged many different times. We read this all throughout the the four Gospels. What is the true Gospel? He was sometimes asked, but usually in a different way. He was asked, what kind of uh, penalty is there for such a uh, uh, breaking of this particular law? What uh, How could, how could somebody be saved? What about uh, what is appropriate for obtained, wh where did you, I'm sorry, where did you obtain the power to do and say such things? Where, where do you get your authority from? And as he was questioned, what seemed to be about certain different doctrines Perhaps you've never thought about it, but he was actually being questioned about all of the truths that are connected to the one and only gospel. We want to look at this in closeness today. After the Lord's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, his disciples were harassed in much the same way. This is an example that we just read how the Apostle Paul was harassed. Everywhere he went, there were people coming behind him, supposedly with authority from the high priest in Jerusalem, to present another gospel. In other words, Paul was a heretic, and he was not presenting the correct gospel. Later, after all the apostles had died, elders in the churches, known to us as the early church fathers were also plagued in the same way. Which gospel provides your salvation? This issue continued on down through Christianity until finally, during what is called the Dark Ages, Christi Christi the Christian church split. We have what was called the Reformation came upon uh, the scene and Protestants broke away from the main church which uh, came to be called the Catholic Church. It was all about various aspects of the gospel. What was the correct gospel? Which gospel provides your salvation? But perhaps we should be asking a different question today. Maybe there appears to be another gospel because there are different foundations used to build these false gospels. Let's consider that today. First of all, what does the word gospel mean? Good news. Now, if you're not familiar with the story of how it came to use this term, People who lived in Alexandria, Egypt, 
were dependent upon the grain ships that would come in every year to their harbor. And as these ships would come in, the word would spread around. And of course, bread being the staple food of the day, they did not have uh, fields of grain growing. They had to rely on these goods coming in from somewhere else. And so the word was coined gospel, meaning it was good news time. Food was here. We can go and buy what we need and we're, we're good for another year. All right, who or what is the good news about then? It's certainly not about grain. Bread of life. The bread of life. Okay, that's a good way to put it. What about God? Isn't it about God? Are you with me? Yeah. All right, reader number one is going to share with us 1 John 4, verses 8 and 16. What is the good news about God? Go ahead. Who, who's reader number one? Okay. He who does not love, love does not know God. For God is love. And we have known and believed the love God, love God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. And God in him. So... The good news about God is that God is love, right? Yeah. Not that God actually extends love, but that he is love. Isn't that what John says? Why is this the good news? Reader number two will share with us Romans 3, verses 10 through 23. Or, I'm sorry, 10 and 23. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So why is this the good news? Because of sin, right? God loves us in spite of our sinfulness. We are condemned by this sinfulness. And yet God doesn't condemn us. He continues to love us. He does everything that he does as an outreach of his love to win us to him. Amen. Reader number three, share with us from Romans 5, verses 8 through 10, please. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus paid the price for our sin, didn't he? Yes, this is the good news about God. He has paid this price that every one of us owe. In fact, we couldn't pay that price unless we died ourselves. Then we'd never be able to enjoy life as a result of paying that price. So Jesus paid this price for each of us. Amen. Is there any more to this good news? Any more? Reader number four. Share with us Romans 6, 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. 
For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. Thank you. Amen. So there is additional good news in this message. Not only did Jesus pay the price for our sin, but Paul goes on to explain that if we are united with him in death, we shall be united with him in the resurrection. Amen? Amen. Amen. Reader number five. Share with us Romans 8, verses 1, 12, and 13. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do not walk, walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Amen. Amen. There is no more condemnation. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Think about it. Not only did Jesus pay the price for our sins, but there's now no more condemnation. God looks at us, those who have accepted Christ, as if we have never sinned. And yet he knows that we're all unworthy. He forgets all about all of the bad, all of the ugly, all of the indecent aspects our life have, has seen and, and been a part of. So if there's only one true gospel, is God's character truly love? Isn't that the basis of the gospel? Yes. God's character is totally love. Everything that he does is a part of his love. Even his wrath towards sinners is a part of his love because he's going to cleanse the universe forever. It is essential that we understand this love of Christ. And I'm going to share with you Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 19. Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 19. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in earth, in heaven and in earth, is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1018 tells us love is rooted love that is rooted goes down deep into the soil of the soul while love that is grounded is the firm foundation on which all our relationships exist there is no argument against love of this kind for there is nothing greater. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul explains that in detail. Love springs 
directly from the experience of possessing the indwelling Christ and becomes the rooting and grounding of our relationship between God and man and between man and his fellow man, that love. This is why Paul encourages us in verses 18 and 19 to comprehend Comprehend. Put it there. Think about it. Meditate on it. This love of God. Know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, he says. The commentary goes on to say, Christ's love is beyond the knowledge of humankind because it is infinite and free, never exhausted, <laughs> and ever presenting new fields of understanding. It is the fountain of our own growing experience of love. 1 John 4, verse 19. Men have but touched with their fingertips the power for living to be found in experiencing fully the love of Christ. But to, as Pastor Finley said last week in the message, to a generation who is starving for love, our greatest problem is understanding God's love. We talk about it. We presume that we know about it. But do we really understand God's love? See, most modern languages compound this, this problem. However, the the ancient Greek helps us with this problem. English, for example, has one word we all know, love. That word is used no matter what kind of love you may be talking about. But in Koine Greek, there are four words used by the Bible writers in order to express whatever kind of love they are speaking of. Now, I'm going to give you four words here. Storge, S-T-O-R-G-E, storge. Philos, T-H-I-L-O-S, philos. Then there's eros, E-R-O-S, eros. And the fourth one, mentioned earlier, agape. A-G-A-P-E, agape. Let's look at these four words for a moment. Storge is love for one's family, for one's kin. Philos, we all know, is about brotherly love. Love for another person. It is the most common word used in the New Testament to describe human love. And then there's eros. It's not used at all in the Bible, but it's talking about love between the sexes. And this is where we get our word erotic from. Finally, agape. Agape is pure love, untainted by any selfish motive. It is an obscure word. The New Testament writers chose to use this obscure word, agape, because they very seldom ever saw this kind of love. But when Jesus came on the scene, the apostles saw it. And so they begin to use this word in their writings, agape, to describe the love of God. God's love for man is demonstrated by God giving man what he needs, not necessarily what he wants. Have you ever thought about that? Sometimes God gives us love in ways that aren't comfortable for us. Amen? But he knows what's good for us in the long run. Agape contradicts all human love in three different ways. 
First of all, human love is always conditional. We do not naturally love the unlovely, do we? It's not easy to love somebody who doesn't extend love toward us. How many times have you ever had to bite your lip because of unkind things someone said to you? Me too, brother. <laughs> Human love is always conditional. However, God's love is never conditional. When we truly understand this, God's salvation becomes unconditional good news. This is very important because until we see and understand and believe God's love is totally unconditional, we can never truly become what he wants us to become because he is our example. Reader number one, would you go to Ephesians 2 and read verses 1 through 6 for us, please? And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Reader number two, share with us Titus 3, verses 3 through 6. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Thank you. Human love is always conditional. But God's agape love is unconditional. It's spontaneous. It's without cause and independent of our goodness or our self-worth. He loves us Amen. with an everlasting love Amen. regardless of what is in our background, of how we think, what we do. He still loves us. Human love is changeable also. It varies with times and situations. It is the only kind of love that we can generate in and of ourselves. God's agape love, however, is unchanging and it is unfailing. The more we realize this truth about his nature of love that never changes, the more we will become rooted and grounded in his agape love. Reader number three, Jeremiah 31, three. The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with love and kindness, I have gone. Okay, thank you. Human love is changeable. God's is constant, eternal. And human love, at its best, is self-seeking. Everything we do or say is saturated with self. Isaiah 53, 6, Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, and Philippians 2, 21, all tell us the same thing, that we all seek our own way and not the ways of God. 
But God's agape love is the exact opposite. It is self-sacrificing. It's self-giving. Reader number four, share with us Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, please. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And again, on the cross is where Jesus displayed his agape love more than anywhere else. He, he uh, displayed it throughout every day that he lived, but on the cross was the crowning example of God's agape love. Amen. He was willing to give up life forever for you, for me. Not just three days. He would die forever so that you and I could live forever. And the more we see his self-sacrificing love radiating from the cross, the more we will be transformed into demonstrating that same agape love. That's why we're told in the spirit of prophecy that we need to spend a thoughtful hour a day contemplating, especially those last hours of his life so that we can become more like him. As we see that, just as the disciples saw it, the more we are changed into his likeness. Reader number five shares the text that tells us this. 2 Corinthians 3.18 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18 For we all with unveiled face beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image of glory and glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So then human love is conditional whereas God's agape love is unconditional. Human love is changeable. God's agape love is unchangeable. Human love is self-centered. God's agape love is self-sacrificing. And not until we grasp surely in our minds, in our hearts, this threefold quality of God's agape love and continue to focus on it day by day, not until we do this, will the gospel become totally unconditional good news to us, transforming us more into the likeness of God. Satan's rebellion against God in heaven was actually his rebellion against God's agape love. The devil found that the agape love of God, not seeking himself, was something that was just too difficult for him to grasp, for him to want to do. Ever since his fall, Satan has hated the concept of agape because it wins people's hearts unlike his where he's always trying to force people deceive people and force people to become his follower. Thus, the very thing that this traitor to God did was to attack the Lord's character of love from the very start. This unconditional love. And when he started attack, when he attacked it, the great controversy about God's character has raged on ever since. And while you may never have thought about the issue of the Father's character being about the true gospel, let me ask you again what we started with. Which gospel provides your salvation? There are three principles that have 
developed their own form of salvation. Let's, let me share them in closing. There was first of all the gospel itself. This method of salvation teaches that human beings must be saved themselves by pleasing God with sacrifices and good works. This gospel was pure legalism. Salvation by works. And it is the basis for all non-Christian religions. It is where man has to constantly seek God. This gospel of self is totally conditional. Conditional. Then there is a gospel that is a mixture, if you will, a mixture of self and selflessness. This is what the Galatian church got caught up in. A mixture of self and a mixture of selflessness. The word that is used to describe that gospel is a Latin word, caritas. How many of you ever heard people express the gospel this way? We must do our best and Jesus will make up the rest. <laughs> It is common, is it not? I see it pretty regular in those words on Facebook. People sharing their gospel counsel to other people. This is the gospel the Galatian church accepted after some of the legalistic Jews followed Paul there. It is the same gospel that many Christians today have accepted. It is the basic uh, Roman Catholic Church doctrine. A mixture of works and selflessness. It is also the same gospel that about half of the Adventist Church back in the 1880s had started believing when Ellen White, Elders Jones, and Wagner began preaching against it. It is a subtle form of legalism. This gospel that is a mixture of those two principles is also a conditional gospel. So that brings us to the last gospel. The gospel of selflessness or agape. This method of salvation is the clear teaching of not only the New Testament but the entire Bible. That's why in Revelation, John calls it the everlasting gospel. It's been the gospel ever since. And how many Christians do you know today think that there was another gospel before Jesus came in order for them to be saved? It's not so, is it? The everlasting gospel is the agape gospel. It's the one and only gospel. And since it is based on the Lord's unconditional, unchangeable, self-sacrificing love, it is his unconditional, unchangeable, self-sacrificing good news. It is God constantly pursuing sinful man extending himself for us. That's selflessness. Total selflessness. The gospel of selflessness is about God giving himself and man simply receiving it. That's the good news. This is the gospel, the one and only gospel. So I ask you again, which gospel provides your salvation? Everlasting gospel. I hope so, brother. <laughs> Let us pray. Loving Father, as we contemplate these different types of gospels, help us to realize, to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is only one true gospel. Yeah. 
the gospel of agape, your loving self, your you are love and you give yourself in order that we might be saved. Everything we read in the scripture tells us this. Help us to realize it more and more. Help us to focus on it more and more so that we will be changed more and more into your likeness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.